This is World of Tanks. A video game with over 60 million registered users. More than the entire population of Italy. A game so popular, it spawned hyper-competitive tournaments with millions of dollars at stake. And the game itself is constantly evolving. Making a game this massive takes an army of its own. More than 1,600 employees worldwide, battalions of developers and programmers, and squadrons of artists and researchers spend hundreds of thousands of hours keeping the game alive. They have to deliver a never-ending stream of new content to keep tens of millions of fans logged on. And it all happens at the mega factory of Wargaming. It's a beautiful spring morning in Kiev. So why are hundreds of people gathering to spend the day in a dark arena? They've come to watch the region's best play one of the most popular video games on the planet, World of Tanks, made by the game development company Wargaming. It's so popular, tens of thousands of fans around the globe are watching internet coverage. The guys here are being watched by every pro team from the rest of the world. They're looking at these guys as the standard. And the stakes are huge. One team in the arena today will go home with $50,000 in cash. The competition centers around one game, World of Tanks. But this game isn't just for competitors. Millions of players around the world log on to dedicated servers, choose a tank from their personal garage, and take to the battlefield with their teammates. Their mission is simple, defeat the enemy. World of Tanks is simple by design. Unlike some video games that can take hours to finish, the average World of Tanks battle lasts five to ten minutes. And yet attention to detail and historical accuracy is paramount. Each war machine is hand-built based on authentic World War II era blueprints and designs. A big draw for the legions of fans interested in military history and weapons of war. But it's far from the only game in town. The video game industry earned an estimated $67 billion in 2012, so there's no shortage of titles for players to choose from. Wargaming uses an unorthodox strategy for drawing players to World of Tanks. They give it away. The game is part of the business model called Free to Play. Gamers don't have to pay for the game, ever. So how did Wargaming earn more than 200 million euros in 2012? It's all about scale. Free-to-play games earn money when players choose to buy in-game upgrades, such as special features, like unique camouflage. Only a fraction of gamers, up to 20%, choose to make these microtransactions. But when the total number of users tops 60 million, that fraction can result in serious money. Even non-paying players are important. They're the teammates and opponents who keep the game running for those who do pay. So Wargaming needs an incredibly large number of users to make this business model work. Building a game this big requires a mega factory that is truly global in scale. Sixteen hundred workers in offices around the world, building vehicles and maps, providing customer support, maintaining servers on three continents, making constant upgrades and improvements to satisfy a massive and ever-growing number of players. It all starts with the techs. And those are built here at headquarters in Minsk, Belarus. Like the rest of the company, Wargaming headquarters is growing fast. To keep up, they doubled their footprint in Minsk, adding a second building. Here on the eighth floor, war machines are hand-built by Wargaming's tank designers. Each constructed to look and operate like the original World War I and II era versions.
This is how tanks used to be built. Parts forged from molten steel, or ingots rolled out to size. At Wargaming, tanks are built in the virtual world, but fundamentally the process isn't all that different. Raw material is brought to the factory and shaped into thousands of parts. Skilled craftsmen assemble these parts into fighting machines and send them as quickly as possible to the battle lines. My main job is tank construction. I make visual models, the things that gamers see on the screen. Many top video games are based on fantasy, not World of Tanks. These machines are built strictly according to blueprints. That's why we depend on the source documents. We couldn't work without them, otherwise it would just be our imagination. Historical accuracy is one of World of Tanks' big selling points. Building tanks the right way requires the proper resources for the job. In World War II, that was steel. In the Wargaming factory, they build tanks from 21st century raw materials, information, blueprints, schemes, drawings and photos. Off to the local library then? Don't think so. There are only a handful of locations in the world that contain authentic World War II tank designs. One of them is in Moscow, where historical consultant Yuri Pusholov digs for nuggets of blueprint gold. We are now on the grounds of the Central Museum of the Great Patriotic War. In the former Soviet Union, the Great Patriotic War refers to the defense of the homeland against Nazi invasion during World War II. This part of the war saw some of the largest tank battles in history. In places like Rossini, Lithuania, and Kursk, Russia, 6,000 tanks engaged in battle. These machines played a crucial role in defeating the enemy and preserving the Soviet Union's existence. As a result, many in the region are deeply interested in tanks. Wargaming claims this connection to history inspires designers to build tanks as accurately as possible. Here, Yuri can get his hands on machines that helped win the war. And more importantly, the plans used to create them. From an office in the heart of the museum, Yuri harvests the material needed to build a tank. I have to say that not everyone understands what factory sketches are. They're essential for the reconstruction of tank models. Identifying the right parts to use is as important as finding the materials in the first place. We now have so many layers of information that we need to make sense of it. Building accurate tanks not only draws players to the game, it helps keep history alive. This is the best way that I have ever known to advance history. No historical films, no educational program has advanced military equipment as much as this game has. Approximately a third of all Russians have played this game. Data mined from museum archives is the virtual steel Wargaming uses to build its tanks. World War II factories had giant furnaces and hammer presses to shape their raw materials into tank parts. At Wargaming headquarters, designers used powerful computers, building tanks by creating an outline, shaping the surfaces and adding vehicle-specific details. They start with a frame, translating original blueprints and designs into an electronic skeleton. Next, the shape of a three-dimensional tank comes to life. But it's far from a finished product. There are very strict requirements for our tanks. We need to design it very precisely with all the necessary details. Tanks don't stay clean for long, so textures like dirt, rust and scratches are added. Texture is one of the main steps of the tank modeling process because it's what gamers actually see on the screen. If it's unrealistic and incorrect, gamers won't believe it's a real tank, a real military vehicle. Battles can happen at any time, and these tanks will be ready. We can change the light from morning until night. It looks like this in the morning, afternoon, evening, sunset. 
This tank started as information sent to the factory from museum archives. It's now a virtual war machine ready for inspection by historical consultants. And they don't miss much. Sometimes they send us over a hundred comments in order to correct the tank. From machine guns to hinges, details must match the plans for each tank. In this particular case, there are the wrong number of locks on the SPTA box. And in this case, there are the wrong number of bolts on the shovel. Andre Medvedev checks the tank against its documents and plans. As soon as the model is ready, our first task is to verify all the dimensions, angles and surfaces. Like tank designers, historians depend on accurate plans. Yuri Pashalok obtained this from the archives in Moscow. These are photocopies of unique reports dated 1944. So how shall I put it? This is quite a rare thing of a great historical value. Accurate plans are important, but so is inspecting the real thing up close. Fortunately, 30 kilometers outside Minsk is the Stalin Line Museum, a 25 hectare exhibition of Soviet era military might. The Stalin Line was a series of fortifications built to protect the Soviet Union from attack along its western border. It's also home to several authentic World War II era tanks, giving wargaming staff the chance to get close to the machines of history, like this Soviet BT-7. There are two miserable meters of space available for three people. The tank driver? I would say one and a half meters. Well, let's say two meters. There's still space for their legs. There's a tank driver and two people seated in the turret. Well, let's get inside and see how it actually looks. All right. They want everything to be right. Exactly. This is a trace from the rifle caliber armor-piercing bullets, which were shot either from the rifle or from the German anti-tank rifle. They had the same size of the 7.93. 7.92. Oh, yes, sorry, 7.92 millimeters. And they get close, very close. We aim for 100% authenticity. However, in fact, I would say we have 95 to 97% authenticity. Working with the tank artists, he makes sure the machines in World of Tanks battles look just like their World War II counterparts. A tank not equipped with headlights, a horn and other necessary items would not go to the battlefield. Missing equipment is not a problem faced by the elite world of tanks teams gathered here in Kiev for the Russia region finals of the Wargaming.net Golden League, the highest level of competition. After months of online matches, the field of over 2,000 teams has been narrowed down to the top eight competing in a four-day series of battles to determine the best of the best. Luke Neller is the English language voice of the tournament. The Russian cluster is the oldest cluster. It's been there for the longest. It was released in Russia first. So the players are more experienced. They did it first and they set the trends. So the skill level here is the highest in the world currently. To the winners, more than just bragging rights. First place earns a $50,000 grand prize. These matches showcase the work Wargaming's tank designers and researchers put into the look of the tanks. But what about the sound? If their engines are going to roar to life, sound designers need to add the roar. Wargaming artists have built a historically accurate virtual World War II tank. And it needs to sound as realistic as it looks. The sound design team is on a mission to record real sound effects for World of Tanks. To get authentic sound, they need a tank made entirely of World War II era parts that still runs. At the Stalin Line Museum, mechanics keep tanks running to make sure they don't fade into history. Their efforts make it possible for wargaming to work with authentic equipment, like this Soviet T-44. 
Yeah, let's start with the T-44. The main goal is to get engine sounds. I need to know some details about how it was built. There are no easy-to-read labels on a vintage tank. So, with a little help from a historian. The exhaust is located at this side, so if you imagine, a little rattle will come from here. The plan comes together. Before getting on the tank, we'll record around it. We'll walk around the tank with a microphone and record specific areas while the engine's on. Don't forget, this is a 27-ton war machine. Nobody should walk through the dead zone at the back. When the tank is turned on, everybody should look at me. I'll communicate with the tank driver. A skilled driver helps to get just what they need. This German Stug 3 is equipped with a modern engine but can still be useful to the team. They're gathering as many authentic tank sounds as possible. And sending them back to headquarters. Right now, we're busy analyzing everything that we recorded. We're establishing a library from this material that will be used for the game in the future. Eventually, World of Tanks will sound as close to real battle as it looks. If the tank sounds exactly the same in the game, I think that will be very cool. You can really feel the metal machine you're controlling. The wargaming team has built a historically accurate tank that looks and sounds like their historical counterpart. In the game, there are more than 250 tanks for players to choose from. Soviet, German, British, American, French and Chinese. With more being added all the time. For Wargaming CEO Victor Kiesley, the key to player loyalty is keeping the game fresh. You have dozens of millions of players, 60 million or something like this. So they have needs. Uh, they paid you back with their time and money already. They want to stay in your game and you have to give them something to enjoy uh, tomorrow, next month and, and, and next year. It takes legions of designers and artists to keep World of Tanks players satisfied. That's why approximately 1,000 people in our company are still working hard every day, and that number is growing, to give uh, new updates, uh, new tanks, new maps, new gameplay modes, new graphical twists uh, to our existing players. You, you have to do that with a successful projects. Um, there are many companies which don't realize that, and they, they think, okay, here's a success, and they stop. And the consumer does not tolerate that. In World of Tanks, Hundreds of war machines would rust away in their garages without places to battle. Tanks in World War II weren't restricted to wide open spaces. Battles took place in forests, cities, and swamps. Knowing the terrain was a huge advantage. Being unfamiliar could be deadly. At the World of Tanks eSports tournament, Remembering basics like the right way to use your surroundings is critical. Keep calm, keep focused, and listen to the instructions. A bad plan done well is better than a good plan done badly. Getting caught in the wrong place can quickly lead to defeat. Dimica is in a lot of trouble. He might have done, he does go down. It looks like mine are going home. It looks like Varga. With that elimination, fans at the Cybersports Arena are one step closer to seeing the champion's crown. And they get an up-close look at how important maps are to success in battle. At Wargaming, building the world in World of Tanks starts with map design. Every map is made up of features like mountains, water, trees and buildings. Arranged to form a landscape conducive to tank battles. For a map to be released to players, it must pass a rigorous three-part test. 
Success is far from guaranteed. I have seen some tendencies that only about 30% of my procreate can end up in release. First is gameplay, getting the right mix of obstacles and open space. When you create uh, one big open space and players cannot find each other, they would have to roll each other in a mess. This is no fun. Uh, so gameplay must be good. Part two is spatial composition. The beauty of the world has to match the beastliness of the tanks. When the spatial composition is failed, uh, you would have good gameplay. But uh, from artistic point of view, map would not be beautiful. Navigation is the third part of the puzzle, making sure players don't get lost. If the map is bad for navigation, you will feel yourself like in labyrinth or something and you will not have uh, much pleasure playing such a map. High standards come at a price. Each map takes 80 hours to design. In a year, over a thousand hours of work is spent on designs that fail. For the few that pass, details are inspired by real-world references, like social media photos to add authenticity. I have found here a beautiful island of Bali, uh, which has lots of uh, useful references which can be worked with. Placeholders mark where objects will go. After that, I put a reference uh, where each place would be located. So I can show you just some of the, the Bali temples. They're really fascinating. Then roads are added, making it easy for players to find their way. Designs that pass the test move on to level art, where maps transform into immersive worlds. This scene might look simple. A tank overlooking a field. Level artists see everything that makes their maps real. Blades of grass, species of trees. The authenticity of our maps, just like the tanks, is very important to us because we want to let our gamers dive into the atmosphere. Artists customize every map, matching details to the style of each region. This is a map of a fjord. Gamers might recognize it, a Norwegian fjord. We found an example of an interesting house with a roof made of grass, here. Next, each house, tree and feature is individually placed on the map, and sometimes replaced. For example, take this house. It can be moved in different ways. We can just move it somewhere, like this, or we can pick the place where it should go. For instance, I want it to go here, so now the house is here. This world reacts to every click. To make the map appear part of the larger world, they use a skybox, a projection of objects in the distance, like the sun and clouds. We can see what it looks like without it if I switch it off. There's no skybox here. And here, I've switched it on. The heavens at her fingertips. According to the shadows, the sun should be somewhere here. What can we do to fix it? We can rotate the sky. It's a huge job creating a world that stands up to the accuracy and detail of the tanks. But there's still room for personal touches. I really like how the flowered grass texture is created for this step map. I really like it. Maybe it's just something about women. Flowers never fail to please us. It's so difficult to create these rich varieties of grasses, like a poppy field. I really admire this work. And this map is just one of dozens in World of Tanks. Winter or summer, desert or mountain, village or city. This kind of detail is part of Wargaming's strategy to keep their 60 million users engaged in battle. And that kind of popularity generated interest from an organization that knows a few things about battle. Belarusian Armed Forces. At headquarters in Minsk, 
Keeping more than 60 million users playing World of Tanks is Wargaming's never-ending quest. Part one of their strategy is creating tanks and maps as true to history as possible. Artists, researchers and sound recordists build virtual war machines that are up to 95% accurate. Next, they have to make the game fun and addictive to play. Understanding how tanks move is part of that process. At a secure location outside of Minsk, the Belarusian armed forces have invited members of the World of Tanks team for an up-close experience. But there's nothing virtual about these tanks. Belarus has around 1,500 tanks in its mechanized divisions. At this facility, soldiers train to operate tanks, and crews practice maneuvers that would defend the country in case of war. Designers love the chance to get their hands on the real thing. What a great machine. You feel the power right away. Today is a good day. Normally, the World of Tanks staff spend their days behind computer screens. Today, they're perched on top of tanks. There's no better way to create an authentic game experience than to feel the machines up close. But these state-of-the-art machines are equipped with reflecting plate armor, fire control, and anti-tank guided missiles. Even the most sophisticated tank from the 1940s wouldn't stand a chance against these modern machines. The same can be said about the vehicles of World War II. All tanks were not created equal. How does wargaming create a fair fight? This is where game balance comes in. We make specific adjustments to not have stronger or weaker machines, but to equalize all the machines on the battlefield. Tanks are divided into ten levels from the small and nimble scouts at level one to the fearsome experimental heavies of level 10. Lightweight classes in boxing, tanks on the same level should be in for a fair fight. Players should know that no vehicles in the game are too strong or too weak. That makes the player feel comfortable playing. Keeping players engaged in the game. At the Cybersports Arena, Wargaming uses the World of Tanks tournament to engage with potential players throughout the world. A broadcast team worthy of a professional sporting event streams live coverage to the internet. Fans' favorite rush are expected to breeze through to the finals. Tens of thousands at home see an early surprise. Rush stumble in their second round match. Just fell into a drop by Gossi and now Gossi Emma chasing him like a pack of hounds. It's gonna be the end of Gossi Emma knocking out Rush, sending them off to the losers bracket. What an upset! Another loss would mean elimination from the tournament. Rush just needs to act not like they did in the last two days. That's the days have been really shaken. They just need to stay focused and rely on their tactics. But uh, Eclipse is not spotted. Regardless of what Eclipse is doing, he can... Oh, he line shots him. There he goes. Eclipse finishes off. Gratia, Gratia go down four battles in a row, two maps in a row. And the Titans of Russia win their second map and move forward. Perseverance pays off. After the early stumble, Rush regain their balance, advancing to the tournament finals. Wargaming broadcasts battles to the world to increase the game's popularity. Like Wargaming, Belarusian armed forces have good reason to get people interested in tanks. Wargaming needs players, and the armed forces need future tank commanders. We can use the game as a training aid for military personnel and an ideological tool. Andre believes World of Tanks is helping shape better soldiers. For example, many players today know more than the basics about tanks. They know the history of how it was built and other details. That's important to us when they end up in the army. The young guys are knowledgeable and the ones that are already serving increase their knowledge even more. While World of Tanks inspires future tank enthusiasts, 
Wargaming helps ensure the sacrifices made by tank crews of the past are not forgotten. They donate regularly to museums and military history centers across the globe, including a 90,000 euro grant to the Bovington Tank Museum in England, where Victor Keesley dedicated the Wargaming.net Education Center at the museum's 2013 Tank Fest. World War II tank battles weren't unique to the Eastern Front. British tanks saw action in theaters around the world. At Bovington, a collection of more than 300 tanks helped tell their story. For Victor Keesley, it's important to give back to those who have given so much. I hope this will help to preserve British heritage as well as uh, bring the enthusiasm of young people who are fascinated about technology, obviously, to use that in to transform that enthusiasm into passion towards world's history. Museums like Bovington are important sources of the information that is Wargaming's raw material. Most factories turn materials into finished products, like televisions or trains. The machines and battlefields in World of Tanks are never finished. They're constantly improved and updated, becoming increasingly sophisticated. The company has achieved so much that now we're not competing with rival companies, but with the reality of life itself, meaning how things happen in real life, how nature, tanks and objects act in real life. Wargaming has created lofty expectations. What if their next project can't meet them? For us, it's not that crucial, it's not that horrible, let's say, to lose $10 million for a project which is not green-lighted. The biggest risk is to run into the uh, community perception that, okay, now Wargaming sits on its success and Wargaming cannot make another cool game. Tanks in World War II played a large role in finally bringing peace to Europe. But the war wasn't over. In the Pacific Theater, another machine was taking center stage fighter planes. So when Wargaming wanted to create a game to follow World of Tanks, they looked to the sky. In late 2013, World of Warplanes joins World of Tanks, taking battle action to the air. World of Warplanes will feature hundreds of warplanes from the golden age of aviation from the 30s up to uh, Korean War. Uh, it will follow the same successful pattern of World of Tanks. But all these planes have to be built somewhere. Adding World of War planes greatly increased the company's workload. How do you get more production out of a factory already running at full capacity? You build another factory. We could not distract our legendary World of Tanks team because they have to make updates every two months and preferably every month. And that's why we had to expand and expand fast. In Ukraine, Wargaming formed a partnership that became their Kiev office. Head of development, Oleg Gotinyan, knows expectations are high. You can approach almost anyone on the street and ask if he knows World of Tanks. And at least in the CIS countries, he'll definitely say yes. He knows and plays it. The goal is the same for World of Warplanes. Gameplay in World of Warplanes adds a whole new dimension. One of, our biggest One of our biggest challenges was moving from almost two-dimensional space to 3D. Tanks drive over the terrain moving in two dimensions. Aeroplanes fly in three dimensions. In World of Warplanes, players can see all sides of their aircraft. When the aircraft is moving and rotating, you have to keep all the realistic details like it is in the real world. Which can be difficult when building planes that never made it to the skies. There are some cases there when you have just a scheme, not even like a blueprint, just a scheme. And uh, you have to just imagine to recreate everything that could be in this aircraft. Like the tank designers, the Warplanes team builds better aircraft when they get out from behind their desks. At the Borovaya airfield, pilots put on a display of aerial acrobatics and planes modeled after 1940s Soviet aircraft. Performing maneuvers not unlike those used in World War II dogfights.
It's completely different to have a chance to touch the plane personally, to hear how it sounds, to see how it flies and experience the acceleration. From early biplanes to experimental models, players will have over 200 planes to choose from. The team knows that World of Tanks and its 60 million users is a tough act to follow. When describing the relationship between World of Tanks and World of Warplanes, I like to say it's hard to be the son of a genius. Creating a second game that's as successful is very challenging as it will be compared to the strong and weak points of World of Tanks. By creating World of Warplanes, Wargaming is looking well into the future. Across town from the Warplanes factory, the future is now for the esports teams battling to be crowned champions. At the Kiev Cybersports Arena, the Wargaming.net Golden League Russian Region Finals are in high gear. Typical World of Tanks gamers play in the comfort of their own homes. Here, the visibility and the stakes are much higher. The noise of the crowd, the commentators, people scream when you die. The pressure is intense. You sweat, the mouse slips, and there's just a totally different experience. But the esports elite aren't your typical gamers. The number of gamers are absolutely professional sportsmen and get paid for it. They have contracts with sponsors. It's not a crazy idea. In nearly every way, this is a major sporting event. Pro teams in uniforms, stands packed with fans, broadcast video teams sending live coverage to viewers around the world. Not one, but two sets of announcers, post-match interviews, and of course, cheerleaders. The tournament lets ordinary gamers check out the best players in the world. It's all part of Wargaming's strategy to connect with gamers. Without players, there is no world of tanks. You do have to listen to them. For now, we have hundreds of people in our community department. They run the forums, they, they go and meet the players, they, they, they go and drink beer with the players in Germany, in San Francisco, in Moscow, in Warsaw, pretty much on a regular basis. The Wargaming Media Machine posts highlights, tutorials, and even broadcasts Wargaming TV news. The world's largest gaming show. If the fans in Kiev are any indication, the Wargaming.net League is building quite a following. The roar of the crowd and the tension play their part. There's very little room for error here. The pressure on the gamers is really big. It's a serious amount of money, so it's understandable. In the broadcast booth, the stakes of the final match are clear. On the line, well, there's a loss on the line. $50,000 for the main price, that's a what? The other prize they can get is reputation and an entry into the two and a half million grand finals if they win this event and come in the top three of one more. It's down to the final two teams. The favourites rush against surprise finalists, Newstar. The winner will be the Russian region champion. Let's give them a round of applause as Newstar go into battle. Hopefully heads high enough that they can focus here and get this done. Underdog New Star hopes an upset is brewing. This is Alex Kitchener. Go at good health and drive before second rest in peace. No, but there we go. Drive or just take out power slide and executor goes down. The favorite rush is too powerful. And is that this could be the end? Fifty thousand dollars made to go with Rush's level. What is made? Rush goes. JJ Rush is now the champions of Russia for season one. Crowning the Russian champion doesn't end the Wargaming Dotnet League. Tournaments with more teams and richer prizes are still to come. Wargaming, in turn, shows no signs of slowing. Steaming over the horizon in 2014, World of Warships. And it doesn't stop there. More games, new platforms, and an ever-growing community will keep their virtual factories running full speed.